Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you? Morning, Jeff. Good morning. So let me. Uh, Shall we get started? Okay, good. Uh, so last time uh, I talked about uh, the basic ideas about uh, market system, market economy, how market forces uh, guide decisions by businesses to hire workers, how the supply and the demand for work determines the wage, how changes of technology therefore change wages and income distribution, how markets facilitate trade uh, and make possible specialization uh, and make possible gains from uh, by specialization according to uh, comparative advantage and how markets in a broad sense lead to efficiency, uh, efficiency and resource use, meaning that uh, an economy arrives uh, uh, at a situation through market forces uh, in which the gains from trade uh, are uh, all utilized and there are no other possibilities for a uh, an economy-wide uh, rise of material uh, possessions and well-being. So I mentioned a, a, a welfare theorem, uh, so-called the first welfare theorem of economics, uh, which is uh, that if market economies, if markets are competitive, perfectly competitive, uh, with lots of uh, suppliers and consumers, uh, then under uh, a number of technical uh, conditions, the outcome is an efficient uh, outcome. But I emphasize that efficiency is a fairly uh, weak standard. Uh, efficiency can mean that uh, a few people in the society own everything and everyone else in the society is suffering and that can be an efficient economy in the sense that any improvements for the poor uh, would reduce the incomes of the rich. And you would say, okay, uh, that's efficient, but not very desirable. Uh, not uh, a society of social justice, of equity, of well being. Uh, and uh, you'd be right in that. So efficiency is only one criterion, but it is. Uh, what markets specialize in. Markets uh, are not uh, uh, arrangements that are conducive to uh, equal outcomes or fair outcomes or social justice. Uh, markets are uh, ways of allocating resources according to uh, profit and uh, uh, and uh, choices by consumers that uh, lead to um, gains from trade, but not necessarily to the common good or widespread well-being. And we looked at a, a little illustration uh, where there were two people or two groups in the society, uh, and uh, there was a potential level of income or well-being allocated between the two groups. And an inefficient arrangement is was one where uh, both groups could be better off than they were at some interior point in that diagram. But it would be possible to move to an efficient outcome in which one group was made absolutely worse off than at the in inefficient situation, while the other group was made much better off. And that kind of outcome is not unusual in history. Uh, many times under the weight of market forces, 
total output has gone up in a society, but certain parts of the society have suffered very, very badly as a result of those changes. And so market economies can lead to rising uh, material well-being on average, but real impoverishment of parts of the society during that process of uh, overall enlargement. Today, I want to talk about all the ways that markets fail in addition to the failures of social justice. A market economy can produce a, a lot of wealth and well-being in certain circumstances, but when the assumptions of perfect competition break down for one reason or another, the outcomes of a market system can be woefully inefficient as well. So the idea that markets are efficient but unfair is not a bad starting point, but a market economy can be highly inefficient as well, very wasteful, uh, very destructive of value, very much uh, failing to achieve gains from trade. And today I want to talk about some of the ways that markets fail, uh, all under the category that uh, is called in public economics, market failures. So let me uh, share my screen and uh, start here. So we want to uh, look at uh, ways that markets may fail to promote the common interest. We've talked about one, which is the income distribution. And this is the chart that I was referring to. Uh, the point on the inside of uh, this uh, uh, graph uh, or this uh, figure, uh, the point on the inside is a point of inefficiency because it's a point where moving in the northeast direction, uh, it's possible for both group one and group two to have a higher level of uh, income or output or earnings. But moving from this inefficient point, it's also possible to move to the Northwest or to the Southeast, uh, in which case one of the groups benefits in absolute terms while the other loses in absolute terms. So that's the questions of efficiency being on the line and uh, equity where on the line. Is there sharing or a very unequal distribution of income? But there are many factors in a market economy that can lead to the economy being at this interior point where all parts of the society are less well off than they should be. And some of the factors that cause economic inefficiency are on this list. They include monopoly, when there's one producer rather than many producers, or oligopoly, when there are a few large producers that uh, dominate the market for the good. Uh, they include the inefficiencies when there are public goods that are not provided adequately by the market. Uh, they include externalities when market production leads to damages to society that are not considered by those who are producing and using the products. And the example for us uh, in our world today uh, is the use of fossil fuels. We uh, use fossil fuels uh, to heat our buildings, to produce uh, electricity, to uh, power our, uh, or to, uh, sorry, heat buildings, power our vehicles, uh, produce uh, power, uh, run industry. But the carbon dioxide that results from the burning of those fossil fuels creates global climate change. The damages of those uh, uh, of global climate change is not considered by the individual producers and users of the fossil fuels. It's external to their calculations, but it creates global damage. Uh, another kind of inefficiency comes from various kinds of congestion. 
uh, when there are <laughs> too many suppliers, for example, or too many consumers uh, of uh, a particular good or service, uh, and the large number of uh, those producers or consumers crowds out or creates congestion for the rest, lowering their well-being. Uh, another kind of inefficiency is activities called rent-seeking, which uh, I'll describe uh, shortly. Of course, uh, various kinds of conflict are a kind of inefficiency in a war or an arms race. All sides end up losing uh, in the end compared to the absence of conflict. Uh, so uh, conflict is itself a kind of economic inefficiency as well as a social disaster. A panic in a marketplace can lead to a huge losses, and I'll describe what that means. And finally, the unemployment of people or of capital goods or of other productive uh, assets is another cause of inefficiency in a market. So when we think about inefficiencies or market failures, it is usually uh, worthwhile to think in uh, so-called partial equilibrium terms, looking at one specific market, whether it's a market for food or for uh, vaccines or for any other uh, good or service. And when we think about that market, we think about supply and demand, the supply of that good and the demand for that good. And the supply curve is the upward sloping curve and the demand curve is the downward sloping curve. And where those intersect is the market determined equilibrium uh, that shows the price on the vertical axis and the quantity produced on the horizontal axis. And the basic idea of efficiency derives from the fact that the supply curve, the upward sloping line, is also a measure of the marginal cost of production under the assumptions of a competitive market economy. And the downward sloping demand curve is also a measure of the marginal benefit of that good for the consumer measured in, uh, by, uh, in, in the sense of how much the consumer is willing to pay for an extra unit of that commodity. And so the rising supply curve or the rising marginal cost curve says uh, that since the cost of producing an additional unit of this good or service rises as there's more of it being produced, uh, you need a higher price to elicit a larger supply. For the demand curve, the idea is that the for the uh, uh, first few units of consumption of this good, the willingness to pay for them is very, very high. But because of some kind of diminishing marginal benefit of these commodities, when the supply becomes very large, the amount that consumers are willing to pay for one more unit of this good or service is lower. And so we can think about the demand curve as measuring marginal benefits, the supply curve measuring marginal costs, and at the equilibrium of supply and demand, the marginal cost of producing this good is equal to the marginal benefit to the consumers of this good. And that's efficient in that uh, it wouldn't pay to uh, produce more of this good because the cost of producing that good would be higher than the benefit of the good in the sense of what consumers would be willing to pay. Nor would it be right to produce less of this good because at a lower level of production, the benefit that a consumer would pay for another unit exceeds the cost of 
uh, producing that unit. So it would be inefficient to produce less of this commodity. It would be inefficient to produce more of this commodity. Market forces, so goes the argument, leads to the right level of production and consumption of this particular commodity. That's true if this is a competitive market so that the demand curve and the supply curve reflect the marginal uh, benefits and the marginal costs of this good. And as long as that's the case, uh, that market equilibrium reflects the equilibrium or the equality of marginal benefit and marginal cost, we can say that the market is leading to the right level of production of this commodity. So what, and when we do so, uh, we can also then measure uh, two quantities, consumer surplus and producer surplus. Consumer surplus is measured as the excess of what consumers would willingly pay for this commodity relative compared with what they actually pay in market equilibrium. So in the market equilibrium, they pay a certain price, uh, the price that's shown at this vertical level. But for these early units uh, of this commodity, they'd be willing to pay more than the price that they actually end up paying. And so if we add up that benefit minus price for each unit of consumption and add up all of that extra surplus uh, benefit, we get the green triangle. And similarly, producers have a lower marginal cost of production of the first units of this good compared to the marginal cost of the final unit that they produce in market equilibrium. And so producers earn a surplus because the cost of producing the first few units is lower than the cost of producing the uh, final incremental uh, unit. And if we add up uh, the uh, price minus the marginal cost for all of the uh, units that are produced, the producer's benefit price minus cost is given by the blue triangle. And so in a competitive market equilibrium, the sum of the consumer surplus and the producer surplus is maximized by uh, production taking place at the point where the marginal cost equals the marginal benefit. And that's why essentially a market equilibrium is an efficient level of production and consumption of this good. Ah, but what happens if instead of a uh, competitive industry, there is just one monopolist uh, that is uh, producing in this market? The monopolist does not produce to the point where the marginal cost equals the price. The monopolist asks the question, if I restrict my production, to what level should I hold my production to boost the price that I receive for my output in order to maximize my total profits? And that turns out to be at a lower level of production than in a competitive market. So what a monopolist does is limit production and thereby drive up the price of the output that the monopolist receives up to the point on the demand schedule, this downward sloping demand curve. And the result is a producer surplus. What is the producer surplus? Well, at this high monopoly price, you can look at the difference of the price and the marginal cost of producing each level of output and the gap between the price and the marginal cost when added up over the entire production leads to this kind of trapezoid 
of uh, producer surplus. And the idea is that this monopolist producer surplus shown in blue here is higher than the producer surplus of the competitive economy. Implication, a monopolist will produce a lower level of output compared to a competitive market. Why? Because the monopolist chooses to restrict production in order to drive up the market price. And even at the lower level of production, the total uh, profit earned by the monopolist is higher because of the uh, gain from the higher market price created by the monopoly scarcity. But this is inefficient from the point of view of the society because at this lower level of production, the marginal benefit to consumers is greater than the marginal cost of production. So in principle, it would pay to continue to increase the output beyond the monopolist level to the point of competitive equilibrium, because all of that extra production, that incremental production from the monopoly level to the competitive level takes place with marginal benefits measured by the demand curve being greater than the marginal costs of production. In other words, we end up with what we call dead weight loss or inefficiency from the monopoly. The monopolist has limited production to raise profits, but that is inefficient because at that monopoly outcome, consumers would be willing to pay more it would be willing to buy extra units at a price that is higher than the marginal cost of those extra units. And this results in an inefficiency uh, of an inadequate level of the supply of this good or service. And that means that breaking up monopolies can restore efficiency. Back to our two group diagram, a, an economy with monopoly power would be giving uh, output and uh, incomes at an inefficient level uh, compared to an economy with uh, competitive producers and competitive number of consumers. And so ending a monopoly can restore efficiency to the economy. Whenever efficiency is ended, however, remember that the distributional implications do not necessarily leave all groups better off in moving from the inefficient outcome to the efficient outcome. Well, that is one example of market inefficiency where the level of output of one part of the economy is not at the high enough level. It's restricted by the monopolist. Another reason for uh, an inadequate level of output in a particular sector could be that that good, that sector, is what's called a public good. In a public good, when I buy a public good, the benefits go not only to me, but to others as well. So if I'm purchasing a good that is a public good, it means that others are going to be able to benefit or uh, even free ride on my purchase. Uh, and that means that if we have a, an equilibrium where a private consumer uh, or private consumers have the uh, demand curve that's shown in the uh, southwest corner of this diagram, 
I'm not sure whether you see my cursor error by arrow, by the way, do you when I move it? Yes. Yeah, you yes. do. Okay. So good. <laughs> I wasn't sure of that. Okay. So if the market demand is given by this uh, demand curve and the uh, competitive supply is given by this upward sloping curve, the market equilibrium would be at the intersection uh, where the arrow is right now. But if at that uh, production level, not only the direct consumers benefit, but others in society benefit from this good, then the social benefits could be given by this much higher line. And if the true social benefits are uh, given by the higher line, the efficient level of production of this good is not this small amount produced where the arrow is here, but society should be producing a much larger level of this public good. The reason that it's not is that the individuals that are buying this good in the marketplace will not generally take into account the benefits that are coming to the non-direct consumers of the society. They only uh, are aware of their own personal benefits, not of the benefits to others that are not part of the market transaction. And in this case, when uh, public goods are produced, they will tend to be produced at an uh, undesirably low level because consumers and producers won't take into account the fact that the social benefits of producing this good are far larger than the private benefits. And uh, we give a technical uh, explanation of this phenomenon the following way, that public goods are goods and also services that are non-rival and non-excludable. So a non-rival good is a good that when I buy it and consume it, others can also benefit from this good as well. A non-excludable good is a good or service such that when it is produced, it automatically uh, reaches everybody in the society uh, and it is uh, not possible to ration the access to that good. So a classic public good is national defense. Uh, a uh, country uh, uh, creates a system of national defense, which automatically uh, provides uh, security to all of the population in the city. The wall around a city uh, in a traditional defense. Uh, the production of scientific knowledge is a kind of public good because when there is an advance of science, that is not rival in the sense that if you use more science, there's less left for me. Uh, it's a, a benefit that we all share. And in general, it is not excludable. Scientific knowledge is a uh, in principle, a common good for uh, anybody in the society. Public safety, such as uh, police and fire services, are a kind of public good uh, in that uh, I am benefited uh, when uh, the uh, fire department puts out uh, a uh, fire uh, on uh, down the block. Uh, Firefighting is not really excludable in the sense of the fire department not being able to say, well, we will only go to the houses that have contracted for our services because fires spread. <laughs> and so uh, a fire department has to put out all fires, whether uh, the individual business or household has paid for that service or not. Having a fire department is a benefit for everybody, whether or not you are a direct purchaser of fire department services. So these public goods have this very 
particular role that uh, or very particular quality to them that they are non-rival uh, in that consuming more by one does not mean less available for others and they are non-excludable and the problem with such goods is that they're hard to pay for because I may love public goods, more scientific knowledge, more public safety, more national defense, and so forth. But I know that if others are buying it, I'm the automatic beneficiary of it. It's non-excludable to me. So I don't really have to pay for it. And as an individual consumer, I don't have to put out my own funds. And in this sense, uh, these public goods tend to be underprovided by the marketplace because no individual consumer has the incentive to spend at the level of the social marginal benefit of these goods. And so the basic challenge of public goods is how to pay for them. Uh, first, how to identify them, how to identify things that are good for society but by their very nature are not provided by individual market transactions. And then how to arrange for some mechanism for those uh, goods and services to be provided. And the answer generally for the last 5,000 years is that governments provide the public goods. And generally, they provide the public goods through some form of taxation. So governments provide parks uh, that are non-rival and generally non-excludable. They provide local roads. They provide the police department and the fire department. Uh, they may provide for scientific research through a government agency like the National Science Foundation. And governments pay for those public goods not by asking for individual consumers to contribute uh, as voluntary consumers because they'll just take what is provided without paying, but rather through mandatory taxation. There are other ways to pay for public goods. For example, scientific knowledge is paid for through philanthropists that donate to universities. Uh, and uh, in part, it's uh, paid for by your tuition uh, as well. So public goods are funded in a variety of ways, but mainly public goods are provided by governments. And therefore, those who say that government should do very little, the libertarians, who generally concede that government should at least provide for defense and for public safety, but nothing else, uh, are neglecting the pervasive uh, importance of public goods in society and leaving those public goods at a very low level and therefore a great inefficiency in market outcomes. So one of the great market failures is the failure to provide adequately non-rival and non-excludable goods. There's another category of goods, very important, that is non-rival but excludable. So what is an example of that? A prescription medicine is a medicine in which, uh, or prescription medicine that is under patent, uh, is a medicine produced by a company that owns the exclusive right to produce that medicine during a certain number of years, typically 20 years from the date of filing the patent. And that kind of good is non-rival but excludable in the following sense. The uh, technology of that medicine, the compound, is non-rival and that the technology is known, 
uh, by anyone who reads the patent or who reads the scientific journal of how that uh, commodity is produced. And the actual production of the medicine may be almost no cost at all. But the uh, product is excludable in the sense that you have to buy it from just one company that is given a temporary monopoly. And uh, that is a good, therefore, that is rival, non-rival, but excludable. Similarly, with almost all of our online applications that are behind a paywall, the good itself is non-rival in that we could have additional users of the application without hindering up to the point of congestion, but without hindering the uh, access of that application to the existing users. But we can exclude those additional users by saying, you have to pay uh, for access to that application, even though making it more freely available to you would not add any cost. Or similarly, uh, access to music uh, could in fact uh, be available to everybody. Uh, a, a, an online recording of music is non-rival uh, in that there can be free universal access to the music, but because the music is owned by somebody, often you have to pay to download the song or to gain access to the streaming on the website. So it's a non-rival good, but it's an excludable good. Well, these goods raise a major question. They don't raise the question of how to pay for them because you ha consumers have to pay for them. So the free rider problem of public goods is eliminated by excludability. But they do lead to a big inefficiency in that too few people have access to the prescription medicine because while it's almost costless to produce, it's very costly for a consumer to buy. Too few people use the online application because while it's costless to provide it, uh, it's actually costly to get behind the paywall. Too few people are able to listen to the music because while it would be costless to listen to the music, uh, actually you have to buy the streaming service, for example, in order to gain access to it. So these non-rival but excludable goods have a big problem. They are used in too low a level. They are produced, but they are produced uh, in a way that is uh, inadequate. And here's a picture that uh, may be helpful. Uh, in a typical case of uh, a new drug or a new piece of music or a new technology, the marginal cost of producing the first unit is quite high. But after that, the marginal cost of producing further units is very, very low. In other words, there's a discovery cost at the start, but the marginal cost of production after that is very low. If there's no excludability, then the market equilibrium would be at the point where the low marginal cost shown by this flat line of the supply curve is equal to the marginal benefit shown by this downward sloping demand curve. And you would get this level of output uh, where these two curves meet. And that would be efficient. But there would be a big problem. The big problem is that at this very low price for the prescription drug or the low price for uh, the uh, online application or the low price for access to the music, there would not be uh, income to the producers to pay for that very high upfront cost of research 
discovery, composition, production, whether it's of the website, the music, or of the medicine. And so the problem with uh, non-rival but excludable goods is this paradox. In principle, you'd like everyone to be able to gain access to this non-rival good because the efficient use of this good should be very, very widespread. But if this good is made freely available, there's a big question, how are you going to get this high initial startup cost covered? Because the efficient price doesn't provide the profit return for the upfront invention. And that is the challenge, for example, of intellectual property, that there is a big research and development cost up front. After that, the good is almost costless to produce. But if you just charge the low marginal cost of production, it won't generate the profits to justify the R&D costs of the first units of production. And this leads to many different kinds of solutions. But one kind of solution is to give a monopoly patent to the inventor, intellectual property, in the form of an exclusive right to produce this good for 20 years. In other words, to make this non-rival good excludable. And if that's done, then the monopolist will not charge the low marginal cost for the drug, but a much higher cost for the drug. The monopolist will therefore choose, for example, uh, to set the output at this level rather than at this level, drive up the price of the drug, earn a profit that's given by this full rectangle, and that will be more than enough to pay for the original research and development. So this is a diagram of uh, a uh, discovery with an initial R&D cost in red in which the discovery is rewarded with a patent. The patent means a high price and plenty of profits, which more than pay for the original R&D. But there is a social cost to this patent strategy. How much of this new technology is actually used? If it's a drug, how many users of this drug are there? Well, the number of users that should gain access to this drug is this uh, equilibrium of the demand and the marginal cost curve. But in fact, fewer individuals will gain access to the drug because the price is kept much higher. An example of this, for, uh, for instance, uh, although there are thousands of examples, is uh, a uh, drug to fight hepatitis C. And the cost of producing that drug is about a uh, dollar a pill. And you take, uh, uh, I think it's uh, 12 weeks uh, of uh, this pill and you're cured of the disease. So it's 84 pills and the cost of producing those pills is therefore $84. But the company that uh, owns the patent to this charges not a dollar a pill, but $1,000 a pill. Why do they charge $1,000? Because they can. They're monopolists. So they set the price at $1,000 a pill. It now costs $84,000 to cure hepatitis C rather than $84. The company makes a big monopoly profit. It much more than covers the research and development cost. But the problem is that the number of users of this medicine 
are far fewer than the number of people infected with the disease. And in that case, the term dead weight loss is literal. People are left to die because of the high price of the prescription drug. So this is one solution, but it's only a partial solution to the challenge of uh, this non-rival but excludable uh, good, which in this case is a new medicine. There's another kind of approach, which is that the government would pay for the research and development. So there would be a subsidy equal to the red rectangle here to cover the R&D costs. But then the, uh, after the discovery, the medicine would be freely available and licensed to any producer. And so the cost of the medicine wouldn't be the monopoly price. The cost of the medicine in the marketplace would be this low cost. It would be, in the case of the hepatitis C drug, $1 instead of $1,000. And many, many more consumers would be using the drug and curing themselves of the disease. So this would be a much more efficient outcome. And so this demonstrates that <coughs> various kinds of market failures uh, have various kinds of solutions. And in the case of non-rival excludable goods, one solution is to give monopoly power to exclude users of a non-rival good, like a new drug. An alternative is to provide the public support to develop this non-rival but excludable good, and then insist on non-exclusion so that everybody can be a beneficiary of the new technology. There's another kind of market failure that comes with a different syndrome. Uh, and that syndrome is called the commons, uh, a different kind of problem. So we've looked at a problem of non-rival, non-excludable goods, which are public goods, non-rival, but excludable goods, which are sometimes called club goods. And now a third kind of good, uh, which is rival and non-excludable. So a rival good that is non-excludable could be open sea fishing, uh, as an example, or many kinds of uh, uh, environmental resources, but I'll use the case of open sea fishing. In open sea fishing, uh, especially in a fishing zone beyond the uh, uh, the uh, economic zone of an individual country in the high seas, anyone can go to fish. Uh, and the problem comes from the fact that each new fishing boat not only has its own costs, but each additional fisher, uh, fisherman raises the costs to the other fishermen by depleting the fish stock by creating congestion uh, of uh, fishing and raising the costs to all the other fishermen. And so what happens is too many fishing boats come into fish this common resource, this rival but non-excludable resource. So the market equilibrium would take place at the intersection of the downward sloping demand curve and the upward sloping marginal cost curve. But where production should take place is not at this point, but at the point to the northwest of this point, where the downward sloping demand curve intersects with the rising social cost of fishing, not the rising private cost. What's the difference of these two upward sloping curves? The private fishermen do not take into account the cost that they impose on the other fishermen. Whereas the rising social cost curve is the cost faced by the fishermen taken as a group. And the market equilibrium for a 
rival but non-excludable good is excessive production. Too many fishermen fishing this common resource. And this kind of uh, rival but non-excludable good is characteristic of situations where you can get congestion. Roadways are examples of uh, non-excludable but rival goods, as long as they're not toll roads. Uh, but open highways uh, are accessible by anybody, but they are rival in the sense that your presence on the roadway uh, diminishes the space for others and thereby can lead to congestion. Central Park, in a way, uh, is a rival but non-excludable resource. Anyone can go in the park. That's true, of course, of any of our parks. Uh, but you can have congestion as a result of that uh, free entry. And this situation is called a, a commons good. And this excessive use of the commons is called the tragedy of the commons. It means that there is a depletion of a scarce resource or a congestion uh, of a scarce resource that is not priced properly. And so the idea of managing uh, a commons good is to somehow align private incentives with the true social costs of activity. This could mean uh, limiting the amount of fishing that any uh, fisher boat can engage in so that congestion is kept limited or limiting the number of people that come into a park or putting a toll on a road or in other ways taxing congestion. So we end up with a two by two uh, categorization of goods and services. Goods can be rival or non-rival. A rival good means the more I use of it, the less available for others. A non-rival good, again, is a good in which it's potentially available for anybody without diminishing the use uh, of that good by others. And the goods are either excludable or non-excludable. And market goods in perfect competition are goods that are both rival and excludable. But whenever the other categories apply, uh, that public goods or club goods or common goods, then the market equilibrium is going to be inefficient. And so the theory that a market economy leads to the efficient production is generally not true. That is true for a certain category of goods, but the market economy underproduces public goods, tends to deny access to club goods like new technologies, and tends to lead to congestion or overuse of the commons. And these are all very deep weaknesses of the market economy that need to be corrected by public policy. There are several other kinds of weaknesses as well, probably the most important of which is externalities. Externalities are like the problem of the commons in that the private activity has a private cost, but also imposes a cost to the rest of society that the individual supplier does not take into account. And so in the case of pollution, a polluting industry it will equate the marginal private cost of production with the marginal uh, benefit of consumption and lead to a level of output here. But the social cost of uh, this activity is much higher because the activity causes pollution and then damages to the rest of society. The efficient level of activity 
of this polluting industry is a much lower level of production, taking into account the costs of the pollution. <clears throat> and so with an externality, a negative externality, in which the uh, social costs of producing this good are higher than the margin than the private costs, a market system will lead to an excessive level of production. And the goal of public policy uh, will be to eliminate the inefficiency by reducing this harmful pollution uh, by cutting back the level of uh, production of this sector. And that is, of course, a pervasive phenomenon that we'll be talking about uh, regarding environmental management, because many of our economic activities create negative environmental externalities. We produce something and we don't take into account the environmental damage that comes from our activities. And the result is we do too much of those activities because we create a level of production in which the social costs are much higher than the benefits. Another kind of market inefficiency is what's called rent seeking. Rent seeking means the use of resources in the economy to uh, capture a given uh, amount of uh, rent or available surplus but the activity to capture that surplus is itself wasteful of economic resources. So a classic case would be two big name brands that are competing for a fixed number of customers. So two fashion companies that have a, a, a shared clientele and they compete with each other not to raise the total number of customers but to attract customers from one company to the other company. And suppose that they start out with a 50-50 split of the market, and then they each spend a high cost advertising campaign. And the advertising campaigns of the two companies does not create new markets. Each one, each campaign is trying to bring the customers from one company to the other. And suppose that after they each spend on a big expensive advertising campaign, the two advertising campaigns cancel out and they end up again dividing the market 50-50. Well, that advertising campaign has been a pure rent-seeking inefficiency. It was a big expenditure of resources that accomplished absolutely nothing. Uh, it... Uh, wasted time and effort and money, but didn't change the number of customers, uh, didn't even change the allocation of the customers across the two brands. And rent-seeking activity is like that. It's spending a lot of money to try to grab a certain profit or income stream, but not changing the actual production structure of the economy in any useful way, only using up resources as part of the uh, uh, attempt to increase income. Much of corporate lobbying activity is like this as well. Maybe the lobbyists uh, compete with each other uh, and they uh, end up canceling each other out to some extent, but they end up spending billions and billions of dollars of resources that would have been better spent some other way. Of course, various kinds of violence and conflict and even spending on weapons are like this as well. So just like this rent-seeking activity, imagine two countries engaged in an arms race. They each spend $100 billion on weapon systems. They end up fully armed, facing each other, but thank goodness the peace remains. What has happened? Well, in essence, they each wasted $100 billion on weapons. Uh, fortunately, it didn't lead to war. 
uh, but it was a tremendous waste of resources and inefficiency compared to much better use of social resources. And I very much uh, appreciate a, a statement by President John F. Kennedy uh, that he made in 1963 when he was encouraging the signing of a test ban treaty with the Soviet Union, where he was saying that the US and the Soviet Union should stop their nuclear arms race. And the way President Kennedy put it, he said, today, the expenditure of billions of dollars every year on weapons acquired for the purpose of making sure we never need to use them is essential to keeping the peace. But surely the acquisition of such idle stockpiles, which can only destroy and never create, is not the only, much less the most efficient, means of assuring the peace. So what President Kennedy was saying was that the arms race, in a way, was keeping a balance, but actually a quite dangerous balance and an unstable one. But more than that, it was wasting money on both sides, the US and the Soviet Union. And there is was a better, more efficient way of assuring peace, said President Kennedy. And that was a treaty between the two countries. Let's stop the arms race. Let's not spend billions of dollars on each side <coughs> in this arms race, and we will both be better off. So an arms race, much less a war, are wasteful, inefficient expenditures that can easily leave all sides worse off, uh, but are undertaken in a uh, defensive reaction to fear of others. Another kind of inefficiency of market outcomes is a financial panic. Uh, and uh, those of you who have ever watched one of my favorite movies, Mary Poppins, uh, has, knows uh, the story of uh, the bank run that takes place in, in England uh, in, uh, in, in the story. And we have had periodic financial panics throughout our history, including as recently as 2008. And of course, in 1933, in the onset of the Great Depression as well. So what is a panic? A panic is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that leads to a massive inefficiency in the economy. And financial markets are prone to these kinds of panics. So here's an illustration. Take a small bank that has a thousand depositors. Each depositor puts in a thousand dollars. So the bank has a million dollars of deposits and the bank keeps 100,000 of that million dollars in cash and in other short-term liquid reserves. And it lends the other 900,000 uh, of the money to long-term uh, investments in other businesses. Typically, uh, on any given day, a few depositors will withdraw their money. Others will uh, deposit money. On average, with slight fluctuations, the bank will uh, keep around a thousand, uh, a million dollars of uh, deposits. Uh, and the few depositors going out and the few depositors coming in lead to uh, fluctuations in cash flow that are very minor. But what if depositors suddenly get the idea that the bank is about to fail? They may get the idea that the other depositors are going to withdraw their money. And since the bank only has $100,000 in reserve, if suddenly more than 100 depositors demand their money back, the bank won't be able to return their money. And if all 1,000 depositors get the idea that a bank run is likely in which more than 100 depositors want their money back suddenly, then perhaps almost all of the 1,000 will jump into the line to get their money out before the bank fails. And the result of 
that is that there can be uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, a panic <laughs> that comes from the fear that a bank run is about to take place. That fear generates the run and confirms the fear, actually. And market economies are subject to this kind of self-fulfilling panic. Now, they also can be addressed with policy interventions, just like monopoly, just like public goods, uh, just like uh, the commons. There's a public policy response to stop panics. One crucial way to stop panics is deposit insurance. Your bank account is protected by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. What the FDIC does is say to you and to me, if you have money in the bank, it's safe. Even if the others come to uh, uh, take their money out, don't worry about your deposit because we, the FDIC, guarantee the deposit. And because I know the FDIC is there, I don't spend every day wondering whether there's about to be a run on my bank. If they try to take their deposits out, fine, I'm safe. And so there are ways to overcome panics, but panic is a standard condition uh, that periodically undermines a market economy until uh, such preventative steps are taken. And the final kind of market failure that we'll consider a little bit uh, in a few weeks is involuntary unemployment. And that's also uh, can be the result of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, this is Keynesian economics uh, or modern macroeconomics. The idea can start with consumers like us or investors and businesses losing confidence uh, in the future of the economy, thinking, you know, I think there's going to be an economic crisis ahead, and I better save rather than spend right now. And businesses decide that instead of spending on investment, uh, they also better uh, uh, accumulate cash for the upcoming downturn. And so consumers and businesses stop spending. That decline of spending leaves a, a lot of businesses not earning money and forcing them to lay off their workers. And that results in a downturn of economic activity and rising unemployment. And that in turn justifies the original fears that led the consumers and the investors to cut back on their spending. And so the result is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of economic decline driven by expectations. John Maynard Keynes, who is the most important figure developing this approach, uh, called these shifting expectations animal spirits. He said that sometimes investors are very optimistic uh, and they're driven to large levels of investment. Other times the animal spirits wane and uh, the result is that businesses become very cautious and because of their caution, their spending goes down and that leads to unemployment and it justifies in a self-fulfilling way that caution that caused the downturn. So uh, the, uh, the result is uh, involuntary unemployment and inefficiency. So final point I wanna make uh, is that uh, we have many kinds of market inefficiencies, but I want to remind us that ending inefficiencies, which is important, providing public goods, breaking up monopolies, overcoming externalities, stopping panics, addressing uh, involuntary unemployment. All of this uh, is uh, not sufficient because inefficiency is only one aspect of the common good. 
fairness is always critical. And many steps, many changes in economic history that have raised efficiency have been hugely inequitable. And if you don't combine efficiency with equity, you can't say that you're making social improvement. And I mentioned several historical cases. I won't have time to describe them more now, but the enclosure movement in which the commons areas where peasants grazed their animals and then those commons were enclosed and owned privately, raised agricultural output in England where this famously occurred uh, between the 14th and 18th centuries, but it deprived peasants of the benefits of the commons. And so it was efficient perhaps, but inequitable. When uh, conquerors seized lands of indigenous landowners, John Locke, the philosopher said, well, that's raising output because the uh, conquerors will be more efficient in land use. But of course it was profoundly unjust. When new power looms uh, revolutionized the textile industry, in England in the early years of the 1800s, that raised English output dramatically, but it left traditional weavers and spinners unemployed. And the Luddites so-called came to break the machines and we ridicule them. But in fact, the efficiency of the power looms and the spinning jennies did uh, create huge inequity that was not addressed by public policy. When automation raised automotive production through the robots on the assembly line, but created industrial unemployment, that was efficient, but not equitable. When expanded trade with China lowered the price of manufactured consumer goods for America, but left many manufacturing workers unemployed, that was efficient, but it was not equitable. Not an unfairness by China, but within the United States, because we didn't ask the uh, beneficiaries of trade, the consumers, to help cover the added hurt facing the unemployed workers. In other words, we did not share the benefits. We didn't focus on equity. And so always in moving from inefficiency, we come back to this basic diagram. Uh, when markets fail, it means that we are in the inside of the income possibility frontier, that outward line. We are at a point like this. Potentially, we can make everybody better off. In fact, various reforms might be for the benefit of group two, or the benefit of group one, but to the harm of the other. So ending inefficiency can lead us to any of the three points, but the only way to end inefficiency in an equitable manner is to take care to make sure that all parts of the society are benefited by the elimination of the market uh, inefficiency. So let me, uh, and there, uh, we've uh, gone a little bit uh, past the hour um, and we'll uh, have a nice hour exam on Friday, uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, good luck on that. And then we, uh, uh, I will reconvene with you uh, next, next week, next Tuesday. Thank you, Professor. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, See you all on Friday for the midterm. Yes, sir.